And that then brings us to our first speaker, Professor Francois Engelbrecht. Some thoughts on sustainable agriculture in a changing environment. Francois, most of all, us are humble farmers. We don't always understand the real intricacies of, of this. And after I've, I've heard you a while ago, I was really impressed. You have the gift to give it over in simple terms to us. And please, we would like to, to listen to you. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Chair and Gerard, and uh, also good to Green for all the arrangements to get me here today. It's a great privilege to be part of this um, RPO conference. Um, I've now been researching climate change in Africa for, for two decades, so I'm really starting to, to appreciate some of the complexities of the changes we can expect on our continent, and I'm also starting to see my own role as trying to provide early warning of some of the impacts we can expect in our region. Um, whoever helped me to, to set up the title for today's talk was, was very optimistic. I'm of course not a farmer or an expert in any field of agriculture. So that quest for sustainability is something that I think many other experts here today and, and many of you yourselves um, can make far more substantial, contribu substantial contributions to than can I. But what I can do is to point out where, se where several of the main risks are in terms of climate change in the, in the country and in this region. So let's, let's jump into this discussion. Um, I'll do my best. To t I'll try and use 20 minutes for the discussion, and then we, maybe we can have 5 to 10 minutes for questions. That would be, that would be really nice. So before we talk about the future, I always like talking about what's happening right now. So just for your interest, what you can see currently on the screen, that's the satellite picture of last night at about 8 o'clock South African time. And it shows the source of the clouds we can see today over the high felt and also here in Pretoria. You can see it's a huge blob of cloud. Its origins can be traced back all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. It's another caterpillar that moved into the Southern African interior this season. We usually have about 10 of these every year. About two, of, two out of the 10 cause flooding. It's the same type of weather system that caused, exactly the same type, that caused the Durban floods on the 11th and 12th of April. But this one is causing just some showers over the central interior and by tomorrow it will be gone. And then there's the next one heading towards the south coast a few days from now. So what makes this autumn and, wind and winter quite exceptional was the large number of these cutterflies reaching us. Um, but that's more just for interest sake. That's, um, that's another, another satellite picture that was taken on the 12th of April this year. And it shows the remnants of the cutter flow pressure system that caused uh, the terrible flooding in KwaZulu Natal. And what makes this system quite unique is um, if you have a look there southeast of Lesotho, you can see uh, with a bit of imagination a spiraling cloud pattern with an area, a cloud free region in the middle, a dark region. Now, a meteorologist would tell you that that looks a bit like the eye of a cyclone. And indeed, it was the very first time that a system that developed a type of eye, so a tropical structure, developed south of 50 degrees south. And that weather system contributed to the rainfall on the 12th of April. That, that of course, resulted in the end in about 40,000 people being displaced and 500 people losing their lives, mostly in the morning of the 12th of April. So it's, um, it's a sign of a changing climate system. So never before did the cutter flow that formed over the interior moved into the Indian Ocean and then developed a tropical cyclone type rotation. And um, that's something I want to want to put some emphasis on today is what about 
types of weather events or climate anomalies <coughs> occurring in this region that we've never experienced before. So I'm going to talk about tipping points in the system. Now to some extent we can of course be prepared for the types of extreme weather we've experienced in the past. At least we have experience of that. But climate science tell us, tells us we should also be prepared for new types of impacts. We've never, we have no example of in the historical record. So that, that will be a big part of my talk today. Um, and that is, that is just a last bit of background on this weather system that affected us on the 11th and 12th of April. What is important here is if you compare those three graphs, they show weather maps for three different cutter flows that affected us in the recent past, or not so recent past, in the first case, 1987, September. 500 people died then in what was known as the Durban floods. And then in um, April 2019, about 180 people died in a flood event caused by a very similar system that caused the flooding on the, um, on the 11th and 12th of April this year. So why I'm showing these slides is that I, I also think we need to distinguish between climate variability and change. So in the case of the Durban floods, they were very, very similar events that led to losses of life in the past. There's also evidence of such an event in 1856 and another one in 1905. So one, can, one cannot say that the 11th and 12th of April floods was the result of climate change. Climate change changed the structure of the system. It made it maybe 10% more intense. That's what the first investigations are indicating. But in the case of the Durban floods, we really should have been prepared. They were very, very similar things that happened in 1987 and 2019. And that's also a lesson for all fields. Um, if, if extreme weather events happened in the past that had a devastating influence on a specific sector, <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about this sector later on, then of course one needs, one needs to do whatever you can to be prepared for the next event. So I think with, with all of that, being said, let's, let's move into a discussion on future climate change in the region. The first thing I'd like to point out today is that I think the, um, the livestock sector, the maize industry, and I, I would say almost every single sector in agriculture really depends on what is going to happen in terms of that graph that I'm showing there on the left hand side. Now that graphic shows future scenarios of carbon dioxide <coughs> emissions into the atmosphere. And as we meet here today, the fate of climate change, or the extent of climate change, is still in the hands of humans. And I would say that it is in, in Africa's interest, and in agriculture in Africa's interest, that the world's climate change mitigation effort gets going and gets going very rapidly. Um, if we are going to follow a future where geopolitics sends us on that red line at the top, which is a fossil fuel future, or even that orange line, that is still a future where we largely depend on fossil fuels towards the middle of the century. Climate change, as I will show very soon, is going to be devastating in Africa and in terms of agriculture. And certain thresholds, science tells us, will be reached where ad adapting to climate change will not be possible. So there, there are limits to adaptation in terms of future climate change impacts. So what the world is really striving to achieve through the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and 197 countries are signed up to this, is a future that, that corresponds to one of those blue lines on the slide. Those are so-called Paris, Paris Agreement type of futures. And uh, the blue line, if that means drastically cutting emissions in the 2020s, um, cutting emissions by about 45% with respect to, the, to current levels by 2030. 
a very, very, very strong challenge. Some say not, not achievable. That type of world can still restrict global warming, possibly to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the blue type of line, um, well, that, that light blue line then achieves what we call carbon neutrality by 2050. So net zero emissions, no further greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from the middle of the century onwards. The blue line is a similarly strong mitigation scenario, which still gives us a chance to keep global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. So these two thresholds, 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, are thought to be the dangerous thresholds that we should try not to exceed. Above that, it becomes the impacts become more and more dangerous. So, the first thing to, to take note of today is the global quest for mitigation. Yes, in South Africa, we also have to make a fair contribution. And it doesn't start in South Africa with agriculture. It starts with our dependency on coal. It starts with ESCO. The coal power plants need to be gone in the 2040s and be replaced entirely by renewable sources of energy. That would be a fair contribution from South Africa. That's where we've, we need to focus on. Otherwise, we will be contributing to low mitigation futures. So let's start to look at how the future depends on these mitigation decisions the nations of the world will be making. I should also say that Africa today as we meet remains responsible for only 4% of the world's emissions. So we, we have a contribution to make, especially in terms of how we are going to develop into the future. But those strong mitigation scenarios, those Paris, Paris Agreement futures, we should also admit that achieving those types of futures are first and foremost in the hands of the industrial industrialized countries of the global north, specifically in the first place, China and the United States. Okay. So uh, a low mitigation future following this orange or red lines, you can see that that sends us towards four degrees Celsius of global warming towards the end of the century, and about two degrees Celsius of global warming somewhere in the 2040s. I'll soon talk about what that means for us in Africa and in Southern Africa. And with those, with those light blue and blue type scenarios where we rapidly reduce emissions in the next 10 years and then achieve carbon neutrality by the middle of the century, we still stand a chance of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. By the way, the value now is 1.2 degrees Celsius in 2022. So we stand a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius in the presence of this massive mitigation effort. And we stand a very good chance of, of at least restricting global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. So that's the global picture. What does it mean for us? Um, well, over the last few years, I've been contributing to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Reports. And that's the, the first type of, of graphic that we generate. It's a map of global temperature change. And it is the, the regional changes in temperature are there shown as a function of the, the global warming, the, the, the level of global warming. So top left is a world that is 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than what it is supposed to be. At the rate things are going now, we will reach that world in the late 2020s or early 2030s. It's, it's, it's upon us. Okay, you can think yourself whether in the current with the current state of geopolitics there's still a chance of avoiding that world from materializing. Because it will require strong cooperation in the first place between China and the United States. So we may say that that world is now more likely to materialize than not. The important thing to realize is that if you look at the southern hemisphere, um, southern Africa is the region that warms up the fastest. 
The, the highest rate of warming detected over the last five decades in the southern hemisphere has been detected in Botswana. Okay. And that is because of the regional climate system. We can get into some of the details about why it is like that later on. Um, should we reach three or four degrees Celsius of global warming, then of course you can see the temperature change in southern Africa are in the order of four to six degrees Celsius. And, and that's, that, is, that is alarming. So three degrees of global warming, three to four degrees, approaches six degrees of regional warming. And that will have a range of consequences for agriculture in the first place. That I'll, I'll talk about that later on. Two degrees of global warming, likely we will see that, and uh, the right things are going now at least, in the 2040s, that's about four degrees, a four degree increase in the average temperature in Southern Africa. So um, remember, up, up until now, the world's average temperature has increased by 1.2 degrees Celsius. We say that's the level of global warming. But here where we are today, the detected temperature increase to date is already more than 2 degrees Celsius. So you can roughly multiply the global value, the global level of warming by 2 to find the, value, the level of warming in the interior of Southern Africa. So, um, moving forward, the next important metric, of course, to look at is rainfall. So, most regions of the world are becoming wetter. Most land masses are becoming wetter. And it's very, very um, straightforward to explain why that is the case. The, the warmer we make the atmosphere, the more water vapor it can carry. That means there's more fuel available for storm systems. So, water vapor, when it condensates, releases energy into storms. Storms are also becoming more intense simply because the, the atmosphere is warmer. There's more heat available to convert into, we say, kinetic energy, into the, the wind speeds and the intensities of the storms. So the general observation across the world is that the land masses, on the average, have already become wetter, and for as long as we continue to warm the atmosphere, land masses will continue to get wetter in general. Um, but unfortunately, there are exceptions. And one of the most important exceptions is the subtropical parts of the southern hemisphere. So if you look at that map, southern Africa, for example, is projected to become generally drier in a warmer world. And that has a lot to do with the cha these changes in the regional circulation system. To explain that in a, in a nutshell, in a warmer world, the cold fronts that bring rain winter rainfall are being shifted towards the South Pole. So it becomes increasingly difficult for the frontal systems to reach us during winter time. And therefore, droughts such as the 2015 to 17 drought in Cape Town and the current Eastern Cape drought, these long lasting multi year droughts, they will manifest first and occur more and more frequently in those parts of South Africa that get winter rainfall. But as the climate system warms and the big high pressure systems that strengthen over us in winter and that, shift these, that help to shift these fronts forwards become stronger, they will increasingly also impact on winter rainfall. So the IPCC, in the 2021 assessment report, made three summarizing conclusions for Southern Africa. The one is that the region is warming up drastically, far, far more rapidly than the global rate of warming. The second is that the region is likely to become generally drier, with more frequent long-lasting droughts. And the third is that in the eastern parts of Southern Africa, including the entire eastern interior and coast of South Africa and Mozambique, we should expect more frequent heavy rainfall events. Despite the general drying trend, we should expect more frequent heavy rainfall events. 
And if we, if we look at the science assessment from the report, uh, if we look at, at that in more detail, you'll see that the report also makes specific statements about the El Niño-La Niña cycle. And the main message is that on top of these general changes I've just mentioned, variability is also becoming more intense. So when we have La Niña seasons, they will bring more intense rainfall than in the past. But when we have periods during which El Niño dominate, the droughts will be longer lasting and more intense. On the average, the longer lasting droughts have the, have the upper hand over the intense rainfall seasons in terms of the long term trend in rainfall. But we should at the same time, at the simultaneously while we prepare for more frequent multi-year droughts, we need to prepare for more frequent La Niña periods with intense rainfall. So, um, there's, there's some evidence, and this is not fully established, that La, Nina appear, that La Nina seasons will occur more frequently. That's not yet regarded as a solid statement by the IPCC. The evidence is not strong enough as yet. And there's also some preliminary evidence that El Nino events will become stronger, like the 2015-16 El Nino. But also for that, the science is not yet ready to make a firm assessment. But what the science is clear about is that when we have El Niño, whether the El Niño itself in the Pacific is stronger or not, the droughts will be more intense in Southern Africa and vice versa with La Niña. So if we, if we summarize those two graphs I've just shown, the change in temperatures um, <coughs> globally, and the change in precipitation globally. For any region in Southern Africa, we find that type of graph. I, I'm showing it here specifically for a start for the Tierwater's Kloof catchment that supplies Cape Town with water. And to explain how this graphic works, we are looking at the x-axis, on the x-axis at rainfall anomalies, annual rainfall anomalies, and on the y-axis at annual temperature anomalies. The blue dots represent the recent past, 1961 to 2005, blue and purple. And then with the colors, we are moving through time until we arrive at the end of the century with the red dots. So you can see in the blue and purple dots something that I think we are all familiar with. Climate in Southern Africa is variable. There are seasons with good falls of rain. There are dry seasons. The wet seasons are usually a little bit on the cool side. The dry seasons are usually a little bit warmer. But as the climate system is changing, with the frontal systems shifting southwards, that is the type of future we end up with if the global climate change mitigation process is not a success. So we end up with a future where, where every year is 4 to 6 degrees Celsius warmer than it's supposed to be. And at the same time, you can see almost every year is drier than what it is supposed to be. All those anomalies are with respect to the 1961 to 1990 period, just by the way. So that, that shows a regime shift in the climate of the Southwestern Cape. It's heading towards a substantially drier climate that is much warmer. And that, of course, will have a range of impacts. One can really ask the question, can the city of Cape Town grow in a sustainable way without finding a new water resource? Um, because, the, as, as I think we all know, the, 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 all the dams that, that one can build in the, in, the, in the relevant catchments have been built. So something else is needed for Cape Town in terms of a future water resource. This is Katsi Dam, Kats, Katsi Dam catchment you see exactly the same type of pattern. In this case, the anomalies are calculated. This was an IPCC type assessment. So now the anomalies are with respect to 1850 to 1900, that so-called pre-industrial temperature and, and rainfall climatologies. And you can see the same thing. We are used to this variability. And I think in our farming sectors across, across the country, we are used to dealing with this natural variability in the climate system. It's sometimes challenging, but our farmers know how to deal with periods of drought as long as they get broken again by good falls of rain, the El Niño-La Niña cycle. But you can see once again, 
as we head deeper into this century um, and as we approach the middle of the century, you can already see with those dark yellow and orange dots more dry years than what they are supposed to be. So multi-year droughts become more frequent. And the temperature increases by the middle of the century are already in the order of 4 degrees Celsius. That's for a, a global 2 degree increase in temperature. And then in those last several decades of the century, the, 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 the annual temperature anomalies are staggering over the interior. You can see 6 to 10 degrees Celsius warmer than what they are supposed to be in a low mitigation future. So um, what does all of this mean. And um, that's, that's where I'll start to conclude. Um, I think if we take this, if we think about this free general message the IPCC wrote down for our region, a drastic rate of warming, generally drier, and more extreme rainfall events in the east. If we think about that, and we take into account that we are currently heading towards 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming being reached in maybe the early 2030s, that's the best estimate, 2040s, 2 degrees Celsius of global warming. What can we expect in terms of impacts in our region? Um, specifically in terms of things that have never happened before. Well, I think the first and most important risk for South Africa as a whole economically is the possibility of a day zero <coughs> drought in the Gauteng province. So that is something that has never happened before. Back in um, 2015 or 2016, at the end of the El Nino drought, the level of the volume fell to 25%. So um, the question is, in a warmer world with, with more frequent multi-year droughts, what is the probability of such a drought occurring not at the end of the century, but in the next 10 years or the next 20 years? That risk is becoming larger. Even if it was a low probability event, it would have such a devastating impact that we must have a disaster risk reduction plan for the Gauteng de Zera drought when the eastern megadams can no longer supply Gauteng with the water that it needs. The second main risk oh, there we are, is, um, is I think important <coughs> for today's meeting. The IPCC made quite a staggering assessment back in um, 2018 in its special report. It made an assessment that should the world warm by 3 degrees Celsius globally, that's now currently expected somewhere in the second half of the century, just because of the biophysical impacts of heat stress on cattle, the cattle industry will collapse in its entirety um, at that point when the regional warming reaches about 6 degrees Celsius on the average, because of the heat waves, of course, that then impact directly on, on, on cattle. And at the same time, the modeling showed that the maize crop is likely to also collapse entirely. That is the type of world we want to avoid. But the question I'm posing to, you, to yourselves today is, what about the socioeconomics of farming? The biophysical heat stress threshold is set at about 3 degrees Celsius of global warming. But how many multi-year droughts can, can even a small commercial farmer live through before he or she has to have to give up? in terms of a specific sector. So if we think about that, the threshold may be somewhere between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius of global warming. It's, it's not a, it, it, that we have to wait for such a devastating change to occur until the biophysics force the change, force the collapse. And then towards the end of my talk, heat waves, that's a big part of the future. Um, they are part of this potential co the complete collapse in the, in the cattle industry but they also impact directly on human lives and mortality. We've seen that just recently in, with the big European heat waves, um, the, the Pacific Northwest heat wave last year. So what does it mean for our own 
outdoor workers, what does it mean for all our people living in informal housing without easy access to clean water when a heat wave strikes? It's literally life-threatening. And the one the thing I can say with you, to you with most certainty today is that the heat waves of the next 10 years in Southern Africa will be unprecedented. They will be more intense than anything we've ever experienced in the historical past. And then finally, um, before I have one concluding slide, um, we should not forget about the extreme weather events in the East. So climate change ta also tells us that we should be, be prepared for more heavy producing weather systems along the East Coast. The biggest risk of all is the possibility of an intense tropical cyclone, a category four or five hurricane, moving as far south as Maputo or even Richards Bay, it can also move into the Limpopo River Basin. And we are, we, we are not prepared at all for a system of that intensity. It has also never happened before. Some, some members of the audience may know about Cyclone de Moyna. In today's classification, that is not even classified as a Category 1 hurricane, just by the way. And it was, it was quite devastating in terms of the flooding it caused back in 1984. So to conclude, um, the good news is, we do not have to be caught by surprise by any of these changes. Uh, if we looked carefully at the science, we should have foreseen the Cape Town drought. The science was very, very clear. It's one of the best documented changes in the climate system, that shift of the frontal systems towards the pole. So we should be prepared for more intense heat waves already in the next 10 years and next 20 years. And that gives us some opportunities to adapt each sector needs to look very, very carefully at the relevant metrics for that sector and adapt to the extent that it can. The other bit of good news is that we do, never, we do not have to see a world that is warmed by three degrees Celsius and where biophysics of heat stress result in the collapse of potentially the maize crop and the cattle industry. It doesn't need to happen. It can still be avoided. If the global climate change mitigation process is a success, and if all nations of the world contribute their fair shares. So, um, Chair, I hope we have some time left for questions, and that's, those are the main messages for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Francois, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I think, I, I don't think I know, when we look mm -hmm. at the red meat industry, our approach is um, not to say it's not us, but to say how are we going to make this better? Um, and surely we have a big role to play. We know what the impact is of the livestock industry, but we also heard from you that this is man-made and we, we can make it better. Um, there is time for questions for about seven minutes. Uh, I've got one question already. That's from uh, uh, Herman de Wet from KwaZulu-Natal asking that there's a perception that invasive plant species will thrive in the warmer climates. And uh, if you have a view on that, perhaps it's very technical in terms of agriculture, but uh, uh, do you have a view on that? Um, well, all I can say, it's, it's, it's unfortunately not my field of yeah. speciality, but um, we should think of a future, of a future that is substantially hotter with more periods of prolonged drought. So all plants that are more adapted towards that type of change will of course fare better than uh, the species that are not. Um, recently I, for example, read an interesting argument being made that in, in a future uh, we, we should look more closely at sorghum production in Africa because it's a more drought resistant crop compared to maize, for example. So um, I cannot make a judgment on whether that's a good idea or not, also if one thinks in terms of productivity of these various crops. But I think each sector do really do need to think about where it can make changes and where it can, make adapt, uh, where it can adapt towards species or crop varieties that are more tolerant to long-lasting multi-year droughts in the presence of very intense heat waves. 
Um, but that's, that's, uh, that's unfortunately all I can contribute in terms of Herman's question. Thank yeah. you. That, Thank that you. makes yeah. a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> any question yeah. from the non-virtual floor? <coughs> There's a question. You're welcome. Sorry, Chair. Um, we are at the cutoff now in April, Prof, and then in May again, within a month. And now in June, maybe the beginning of July, there was one in Australia. So that's now all in the eastern part of the countries or the continents. I mean, eastern, also the eastern part of Australia. So that's now all part of the global warming. As you said, it's, it's happening on the east of each of the continents, and it's a bigger risk, and it's going to happen more and more. Because I followed that, and to me, that was very interesting when the Australian uh, people said this is the first time they've they ever had something like that. Yeah, so the, the, the it, is, it is really fascinating that the recent Australian floods have been caused by exactly the same type of weather system. And in fact, these cut-off lows, in our case, form over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so if they actually almost always form over a cold ocean, then they move from the west to the east across the interior. But something very special happens to the weather system when it moves off from the interior towards the coast. Because of the, the fact that it is initially over the interior and then it moves towards the coast, the system becomes deeper. And the fact that the system becomes deeper in terms of the volume of air that it occupies, that has this interesting effect of building what the Australians call explosive cyclogenesis. So a deep surface low almost always develops along the east coast when the cutoff low moves from the interior to the east coast. And almost all flood events in, in um, the, the what we previously called Port Elizabeth or Quebeja, the Cape South Coast, Durban, almost all these flood events are caused by the deep surface low that forms off the coast when the system moves from the interior to the coast. So exactly the same process also works over Australia. So that's a technical reason why the cutoff lows are are so especially <laughs> dangerous over East Coast regions. But of course, a cut of low all by itself is a very intense weather system, and they can also cause devastating floods over the western parts of continents, and in our case, the most infamous example is of course the Lyingsburg flood, 1981. That was also a cut of low. But um, the, the science is not clear whether cut of lows themselves will occur more frequently. In fact, indications are that they are supposed to occur less frequently because they are part of the, the same type of family of systems as, as cold fronts. So they are supposed to be shifting towards the South Pole. But when they occur, because they occur in a warmer world, they have more moisture available, the, the Indian Ocean is getting warmer, we can expect them to be more intense and to cause more rainfall than ever before. The systems themselves are supposed First, climate science theory indicates that they will rather become less frequent than more frequent over our, over our part of the world. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, only one more question. Wandile, you're very welcome. Uh, Professor, thank you so very much for your presentation. You really helped deepen our understanding of these flows. You made a point there that worries me about the frequent occurrence of these La Ninas. And I wonder if are we going to see a more prolonged cycle of the, of the opposite of that, the El Nino, just like we have seen now this La Nina. And I take your point that you say the evidence is still somewhat shaky as to whether they will occur often or not. I would like you, if you can opine on that, sure. thanks. Sure, Mandini, such a, such a relevant question. Also, if we think about what's waiting for us in the coming summer. So right now, the indications are, the chance is about 50% that we are going to have another La Nina this summer. Which is a bit of a surprise. It, that will be the third one in a row, of course. The third summer season in a row with La Nina. That has only happened twice before, since 1950. So that is consistent with this this preliminary evidence we have that La Nina events will start to occur more frequently. Um, the we, we, are, 
we are sure to soon after that move back into the next El Nino phase. So there may be, if we are fortunate, some neutral years before we hit the, the, the El Nino phase again. And um, interestingly, the science indicates that El Nino events are likely to, to be become stronger, but not to occur more frequently but cause more intense droughts when they occur. Now that the latter part is something we can already see. Whether El Nino becomes stronger or not in the Pacific Ocean, we should expect it to bring more intense droughts associated with more long-lasting and intense heat waves than in the past. So we need to prepare, to summarize, for a more intense La Nino El Nino cycle in Southern Africa. We have experience, of course, with dealing with this variability, but it intensifies in terms of the amplitude of the impacts. And the science that this is already happening is clearly discernible if we look at what has just happened now with the last La Nina summer. And just think back of that absolutely devastating 2015-16 El Nino drought across our in interior and into Botswana. That is the type of variability we will see increasingly for as long as the world continues to war.